As you're turning to join me in 1 Peter 2, if you're taking notes this morning, the title of the message is Understanding Authority and Submission, Part 2. And last week, just by way of introduction, we saw that we were moving into a new major section of 1 Peter. And this new major section of 1 Peter is focused on Christians living in submission in this world. And so we took a step back last week, and we're taking a step back this week, wedging in two topical sermons on authority and submission, so that when we, Lord willing, next week, return back to 1 Peter in greater detail, though we're in 1 Peter today, we'll have a greater grasp of what Peter is telling us. Because this topic of authority and submission has been turned inside out and upside down by the world that we live in. And so to say those two words, we can't assume that we actually understand what they mean and what they're supposed to look like. And so we are marshalling together some big ideas of the Bible today. So today's a little bit more of a lecture than it is a sermon in that sense. But we're bringing together what the Bible teaches to understand this glorious topic. So without further ado, if you would, look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. And I'm going to read 11, 12, and 13. Skip down to 18 and skip down to 3, 1. And the reason I'm reading these select verses is I want you to tune your ears to what Peter tells us, the church, when he says, be subject. See if you can notice how many times he says that. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, that's unbelievers, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and on the text goes, look at verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And finally, chapter 3, verse 1, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. Let's, let's pause there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we continue to look into your word with the hope, the prayer, the desire, the expectation that your spirit would illuminate your word, give us understanding according to your word, so that we might praise you for your glorious grace in the gospel, that God the Son became flesh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the grave for our justification, and Lord, by grace through faith, we're saved. And when you save us, that means that you also call us to live in a certain way in this world. There is a way that you have designed the world to work best for human flourishing and for your glory and for our good. And Lord, we see in your word that much of that is bound in authority and submission. And we confess, Lord, that if there were ever two topics, two sides of one coin that have been misunderstood, abused, maligned, it's these, authority and submission. So we pray for a special grace upon us, upon every heart, from friends who are among us who are not yet followers of you, Jesus, that you would convict them of their sin, cause them to marvel at your grace, and that you would save. 
and that for all of us, we would know how to live, move and have our being in you in this world. So, Lord, without without your help, we're lost. But with you, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So strengthen us this morning, Lord. Would you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight? O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, all of God's people said, amen. Question authority unless you have it. I think that's a good slogan for our age. Question authority unless you have it. I am surprised that the word submission has not been outlawed by the thought police. The spirit of our age is to view any call for your submission and your obedience. The spirit of our age says submission and obedience is a demeaning evil. It's a misogynistic, patriarchal, backwards throwback to a time that we have evolved from, that we have um, grown wiser in, that if you call someone to submit, if you say the word obedience, that is an evil attempt at power to oppress. To tell someone to submit is an obvious affront to any free-thinking liberated, self-empowered person. And that could not be further from biblical truth. We saw last week that authority is God's good creational gift. And we're going to see this week that submission is God's good creational gift. It would make sense that in a Romans 1 type, closed fist, shaking at God, human rebellion, and it would make sense in a world that is under the sway of the enemy of our soul, Satan, that those very good things that God gives, authority and submission, would be perverted and inverted and abused by Satan in an unbelieving world to make them look ugly. Well, in the Bible, they're beautiful, and we need to see why. And so today in our text, as we take a very high view, going all the way down to 3.8 and beyond, 1 Peter 2 gives you perspective on good submission. 1 Peter 2 this morning gives you perspective on good submission in your life and calls you Each of us calls us to live a life of good works that display Jesus to various authorities around us, especially non-Christian authorities. 1 Peter 2 and following gives you perspective on good submission in your life and calls you to live a life of good works that display Jesus to authorities over you, especially non-Christians. Now, Here's the outline this morning. The same format as last week, different from our norm, which is to take a text and to walk through uh, clause by clause a text. Instead, we're taking a question and answer format this morning. A question and answer format, kind of a catechesis, if you're familiar with that. Question and answer format to help us understand what the Bible says at a high level regarding authority and submission so that we can zoom in in the coming weeks on our specific texts. So if you're taking notes, here's the outline, the four sets and series of questions this morning. Number one, what is submission, obedience, and where do they come from? What is submission and obedience, and where do they come from? We'll look at 1 Peter 2, 11 and following. And then the second set of questions. Number two, who gets and gives submission and obedience? And we'll look at those three verses I read at the beginning, 2, 13, 18, and 3, 1. Our third question, is disobedience ever justified? 
And finally, what is the purpose of godly submission? And we'll also look at a handful of verses there. Like last week, there is a ton of biblical content coming to us this morning. And so my request or my suggestion to you is to go back this week and to listen again, maybe even to last week, one more time, and to this week. And when you listen later this week, pausing and taking your notes. But this morning, listen. Don't get lost in taking notes to miss the message. Listen to the message. Take notes later if it's there's going to be a lot. But it's it's for our help. So so here's the big idea. Same big idea as last week. The big idea in the Bible is this. Authority and submission are gifts from God to be exercised in God's ways, are for human flourishing, and advancing the gospel in God's world. That's the big idea of authority and submission. Let's jump right into these questions. Let's roll up our sleeves. Number one. What is submission, obedience, and where do they come from? If you have your Bible open still, look at 2.13. 1 Peter 2.13, Peter begins as he moves into specific spheres or areas of authority in the world. He deals with government. He deals with the paradigm of society through slaves and masters. He deals with a household In 2.13, be subject. Note those words. Maybe underline it. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Look at verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. 3.1. Wives, likewise, be subject to your own masters. Husbands. Let's pause there. We saw last time, as we've been traveling through 1 Peter, all through chapter 1, and now halfway through chapter 2, Peter has been extolling the glories of the gospel. All that God has done to rescue us from his wrath and our sin against him to bring us from death to life. And God did this by sending his son Jesus to live, die, and rise in our place for our sins so that when we repent and believe in Jesus, we're saved. And when we get saved, there's all of these amazing treasures that are attached to the future hope that we have of a new heaven and new earth and new glorified bodies and all of these amazing ideas and realities. And now what Peter is doing is he's applying because God has done this this for us in Jesus, this is how we live for Jesus in a fallen world. And that's this new section that we are in. This new section focuses on how Christians variously submit and obey different authority structures in our world. And Peter's emphasis is non-Christian authorities. The non-Christian husband, the non-Christian boss, the non-Christian government. Not exclusively, but it's his emphasis. And Peter explicitly mentions submission. We saw it in 13, 13, be subject. Verse 18, be subject. 3.1, be subject. Peter's telling us that there is submission to the state, submission in society, and submission in marriage. Again, last week was an overview of what the Bible teaches on authority. So go back and listen to that. Today is the other side of the coin. One side of the coin is authority which means the other side of the coin is submission and obedience. As we saw last week, just as every human being will have some measure of authority to exercise in their life over others, 
This week we're seeing every human is to be in submission and obedience in their life in some way. There is not a single human being, not a single person who is exempt from the biblical call to submit and to obey. No one. And for now, as we begin to introduce this topic, the question before us, the first set of questions here in this first point, is what is submission and what is obedience? These greatly maligned and greatly misunderstood biblical teachings. By way of definition, submission communicates some sense of hierarchy. And based on the biblical context, submission carries the idea of lining up under that hierarchy, that authority. If you have authority, you must have submission in the Bible. Submission carries the idea of following an authority. And obedience is similar, and it means essentially to follow instructions. Some, some type of instruction or rule or even command is given, and the one in submission, the one who is to obey, follow those instructions. Now, when you read through the Bible, even here in 1 Peter, if you just really spend time looking at how Peter uses the idea of submission and obedience, there's far more overlap in meaning than difference. They're far more similar than dissimilar. So one way that you can nuance this in the Bible, and this is key, there's a lot of key things I'm going to say this morning. So the first one is that submission, the way that it's used in the Bible, focuses on your inner disposition. Submission is flavored with the idea of the condition of your heart. Whereas obedience is more external, it's what we actually do. Shouldn't press those too far, but that's how they're flavored. So to be clear, submission and obedience are the other side of the coin of authority. You can't have one without the other without the other. And last week we learned that if authority is Jesus's delegated power or right to make decisions, give orders, establish plans to variously enforce obedience, if Jesus has all authority in heaven on earth and he delegates that authority to various authorities, then submission is the Jesus-required response to his appointed authorities. Submission and obedience is Jesus' required response to Jesus' appointed authorities in whatever sphere of life they're in. We comply and we do what the authority requires. I'm speaking in generalities. We're going to get into specifics in weeks to come. But generally speaking, Jesus requires people, you and me, under authority to submit to authority as the authority operates within their purposes and boundaries. More on that to come. With that perspective, in this first point, let me give you three key takeaways on this notion of Submission and obedience in this first point. Here's the first takeaway. Authority and submission are not a result of the fall. They are a pre-fall creational gift. That is critical for you to understand. To have authority and to have a submission was how God designed the world to work before Adam sinned and plunged the world into ruin. Rightly exercised, authority and accompanying submission are life-giving, world-building gifts for human flourishing. 
Adam and Eve had job descriptions in the Garden of Eden before the fall. And they were to live out in harmony, complementing one another with different job descriptions to work as a team to create life-giving, world-building, human flourishing in the world. And that was through Adam's authority and Eve's submission. But yes, this side of the fall, this side of the, the bitten fruit, both authority and submission have been deeply marred. They have been abused. They are tainted by sin because Jesus gives them to sinners. Those in authority have remaining sin. And if they are not in Jesus, they only are sin. Same with submission. But faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit begin to restore proper authority and submission before the fall. As believers, it's the Christian marriage, the Christian business, dare I say a Christian government. When Christians are in authority and Christians are in submission, it begins to be flavored with the gospel, the way it was intended. So to think of authority and submission, since it's a pre-fall gift, to say this in a different way, the Christian, you and I, we cannot despise authority and we can't despise submission. So it's a curse word and vilified word in the world outside authority and submission, both of them. But for the Christian, we must love authority and submission because those are Jesus's design gifts for the world. That's the first takeaway. It's a pre-fall good gift. Here's the second takeaway you need to understand. Authority and submission is between equal image bearers of God. And we saw that last week, and it bears repeating this week. Authority and submission are between equal image bearers of God. What do I mean? The Bible does not give us a functional caste system. Where some human beings, I'm going to use a philosophical word, are ontologically superior to other human beings. No, every single one of us is an image bearer of God. So the president or the queen who have authority are not superior as a human being, but they are just as an image bearer of God as the lowest person in society, so to speak. So when the Bible gives us authority and submission, that is not to say, and this is key, that you're a doormat, that you are a second-class citizen, that you are subhuman, that the Bible does not give permission to think that way for anybody in submission. The citizen, the wife, the child, the worker, whoever. Authority and submission is between equal image bearers of God, and therefore there is no caste system in the Bible. So when someone says to submit, it doesn't mean they're a doormat, second-class citizen, or subhuman. I remember performing a wedding for uh, so, some... Um, uh, a, a young woman who was in the youth group that I pastored for a number of years. And when I performed the wedding, much later, not while she was in youth group, that'd be weird. Uh, she asked her grandmother to read from Ephesians 5 as part of the wedding ceremony. And the grandmother was a very limit, liberated woman. And in her liberation, when she was reading Ephesians 5 about wives submitting to their own husbands as to the Lord... She paused, and the way that she read the scriptures dripped with the venom of disdain and disgust. And I was biting my tongue at how she disrespected the Lord and disrespected the word of God because she thought that submission, she assumed, was to be a subhuman second-class doormat and that her granddaughter was becoming that. That's not the biblical case. 
The third takeaway in this first point is this. If, the, if submission is a pre-fall gift, if submission is not a doormat but between equals, the third takeaway in this first point of what is submission and obedience is that when God calls for submission, he tells the submitter to submit not the authority to enforce submission. Let me explain that. What does that mean? Here's what that means. Submission is something Jesus tells us to do to ourselves. We must submit ourselves. So if you go back to our text in these different verses, it does not say, Peter does not say, governments make your citizens subject to you. Masters, make your servants subject to you. Husbands, make your wives subject to you. It does not say that. It says, Christians, be subject. Subject yourselves to the governing authorities. Slaves, servants, subject yourselves to your masters. Wives, subject yourselves. Submit yourselves to your husbands. This is a key point. We are told to be the ones who do the submitting so that we submit. Now, not giving a death by a thousand qualifications. Yes, it's true. The state holds the sword. Yes, it's true. Parents hold the rod, both of which to physically enforce compliance, according to the Bible. But that's it. All other authority structures cannot force submission. They have various mechanisms. The boss can fire. The church can excommunicate. The husband can pray. But the husband cannot physically force submission of his wife. The boss cannot physically force submission and obedience of the worker. And on we can go. The point here is that submission is something that we're supposed to do to ourselves in all spheres of life, not something that an outside authority should have to threat or force or coerce or counsel us in. We're to be submissive. We're to be submissive. So in this first point, we're asking at a high level, what is submission? What is obedience and where do they come from? We see that they are, come from God. They're a pre-fall creational gift for how the world works best. And because that's true, authority and submission is between equal image bearers of God. There's no caste system. And third, submission is something God tells us to do to ourselves. Not for the authorities to force us to do it. So with this foundation, we come to our next set of questions in the Bible. Number two, who gets and gives submission and obedience? Well, just as all authority, we saw last week, comes from Jesus and is accountable to Jesus, so too all submission and obedience is ultimately to Jesus and accountable to Jesus. That means when children disobey their parents, they're ultimately disobeying Jesus. Because it's Jesus' authority given to parents. And when the parents give a rule and the kids violate it, it's not just sinning against the parents. It's sinning ultimately against Christ. And the same is true, we were going to see, when it comes to the government. Jesus appoints governing authorities, so when we rebel against them, lots of qualifications, but in general speaking, we're disobeying Jesus. Just as all authority is not the same thing, but the different authorities have different purposes and boundaries, the same is true for obedience and submission. Last week we saw that authority is not the same. Governmental authority of the state is different from your boss, which is different from your household. There are authorities, but they're not the same. 
that means that submission is not the same. Right? Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters. 3.1, wives be subject to your husbands. The authority of the government is different from the various authorities of society. What does this mean? This means that submission, your submission to various authority structures of government, of society, and home are all different. And submission has a different job description and looks different to the government, to society, and to the home. Specific submission is given to specific authorities. What do I mean? We are not under the governmental authority of Canada. That's obvious, but, but think about it. Nor are we under the authority of New Mexico. Nor are we under the authority of Maricopa County. Jesus does not require us to obey Canada, New Mexico, or Maricopa. If we travel there, then we have to be in submission to whatever laws of the land are. The sheriff is bound by his county line. Right? So there's different authority structures, and there's different rules. And so your job description of submission and obedience changes where you're going. Our church is not under the authority of the elders at Grace Church or Flag Bible. You as members are not to submit and obey to Joel or to Mark at Flag Bible and Grace, respectively. You're not in covenant with them, even though we are fellow believers in Christ. And neither is the saints of Flag Bible or the saints of grace required to submit to our church and our elders. Those are different jurisdictions of authority. A wife, look at 3.1. Likewise, wives be subject to every single husband there ever was. <laughs> You've read this before, I see. You know it doesn't say that. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands. A wife submits only to her own husband and not any other husband because there is no other husband than her own husband. She is not required by Jesus Christ to submit to other husbands or to other men in general, only her own husband. Jesus requires children to obey their own parents. Not all parents, not all parents hold the rod for all children there ever was, only those parents. If you work at Gore, NAU cannot hire you or fire you. These are obvious to us, but when you think about it, the authority comes with a job description, which means submission comes with a job description. And we have to be clear on what Jesus requires in those different areas. There's boundaries. So here is another key principle on submission from the Bible. Jesus requires us to submit and obey respective of the authority. That should be obvious. But here's another one. Here's another, here's another one that's really critical to understand regarding submission and obedience. We submit even if we disagree. Jesus requires us to submit and obey even if we disagree precisely because Jesus put the authority over us. What does that mean? In general, if there is a tie of disagreement, so to speak, it always goes to the authority. The tie always goes to the authority figure, generally speaking. Jesus authorizes authorities to decide. 
That's why they're in the authority. And so we submit. You may not like the speed, li speed limit. You may not like this rule or that, and we can debate them. But generally speaking, when we are under authority, even if we disagree, we submit to that authority and we obey. Even if we disagree or dislike the decision or the directive, the citizen, the employee, the elders, the wife, the child are to line up under and follow and do what the authority requires. Your feelings, your preferences, and even your conscience are not free tickets to override authority. So here's what a submission and, submission and obedience does not say. Submission and obedience does not say, I will follow your lead so long as you lead the way I want you to lead. And then when you don't lead the way I want you to lead, I won't follow your lead. That's not submission and obedience. That's the tail wagging the dog. Jesus does not allow that. More on the next point. But biblical submission actually submits. Wives really do submit to their husbands. Children really do obey their parents. Church members really submit to their elders. Citizens really submit to the state. Employees really submit to their bosses. Because that's how Jesus designed the world to work. And when we are unsubmissive, when we otherwise should be, we are sinning and inverting what Jesus requires of us. Because to submit to human authority is ultimately to submit to Jesus' authority. And to not submit to human authority is to ultimately not submit to Jesus' authority. Submission is to Jesus. But that then leads to the next question. Is disobedience ever justified? I think our individualistic, autonomous, American, Wild West, don't tread on me, give me back my bullets culture, says, of course, of course, of course we can disobey and it's sometimes justified. To which I want to say, hold on a second. Hold on a second. It's in our blood to don't tread on me, but is it in the Bible's blood? Hold on a second. Is there biblical justification to disobey? What does the Bible say? Does the Bible, and therefore Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, does the Bible require perfect submission and obedience to authority? Blind, perfect submission to authority. After all, if we go back, and yet again, read these verses beginning in 2.13 and down. There's no verse here in these verses where Peter says, submit and obey except when dot, dot, dot. You're not going to find that in 1 Peter. You don't see that in Ephesians 5 regarding marriage or Ephesians 6 regarding slaves and masters and children. You don't find it in Romans 13 when Paul tells us to submit to the government. So on first glance, there's a lot of verses that we can look at here where there is no permission given to you and me to ever disobey, which would mean that any disobedience is always sin before Jesus. So is non-submission and disobedience ever godly in the Bible? Is it ever godly to disobey? Is, is it ever Christian to disobey authority which would please Jesus? Because again, look through it. You don't find that verse here. 
And not because it's in our blood, but because it's in the Bible is the answer yes or no. And the answer, if it's ever godly to disobey, is... <laughs> Well, amen. Thanks for coming this morning. One hundred percent. Yes. One hundred percent. Yes. There are times that the right thing to do is to obey Jesus by disobeying man. Now, wait a second. How do we get here? How did I just bring us there? I just made a sweeping statement. Here's an important key to understand when reading the Bible. The Bible has come to us through men from God. So yes, there are lowercase a human authors, but God is the divine author of the entire book. That's why the fundamental principle of reading the Bible is Scripture interprets Scripture. And because the whole Bible comes to us from God, that means that we ought to do systematic theology. What does that mean? That's a fancy way of saying we ask the Bible, what does the Bible say about submission? And we don't just look at a few proof texts. We look at all the texts. And we synthesize or systematize all the Bible says, bringing it together. And then we get this full picture. So I just said, if you look at Peter chapter 2 alone, we would come away if we only had 1 Peter that we always submit, period. So let me give you, as I've been thinking about this, thinking through Scripture, reading Scripture, studying Scripture, what do we do when authority turns into tyranny, even tyranny in the name of God? I have found at least 20 different episodes in the Bible where God was honored by human disobedience. 20 and counting. I have surprised at how this list keeps growing. Let me give you 10 quick examples. I'm going to rifle through these. 10 quick examples of when it was good to disobey man as an act of obedience to God. Rifling through these. Ex Exodus 1, the famous passage of the Hebrew midwives. Pharaoh, their king, told them to kill the baby boys. These women lied and deceived and saved baby boys, and God was pleased with them and memorialized their name for eternity. They did the right thing by politically disobeying Pharaoh. Or, in 1 Samuel 25, in 1 Samuel 25, there is a foolish and wicked husband. A foolish and wicked husband with a wife named Abigail, and she disobeys her husband and is honored by King David and honored by God for her disobedience to her foolish and wicked husband. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, children are told to disobey their parents when their parents' rules and statutes and idolatries are commanded of them. And they are to obey God, not their parents. Can't get into a lot of qualifications there, but in Ezekiel 20, the Lord is telling us, he's reminding us what he told the children in the wilderness that had to disobey their first-generation parents. In Daniel chapter 1, the entire book of Daniel is about political disobedience, defying dietary restrictions, chapter 1. Daniel 3, not worshiping the statue. Daniel 6, praying against the king's edict, praying to God. We could go to Esther, 
when Vashti breaks the king's law to preserve life. Number six, in Esther 3, a socio-political disobedience. Mordecai does not bow down and honor Haman. Mark 2, Jesus picked grain against Sabbath religious customs and religious laws. They were religious laws placed on the Bible, and Jesus disobeyed them, pleasing the Father. Number eight, in Matthew 22, when Jesus says, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's, you know what the implication is? Not everything belongs to Caesar. And so when Caesar tries to take things that belong to God, Jesus says no. Number nine, in Acts 4 and 5, the apostles were commanded to stop preaching Jesus. And they said, in effect, whether it's good to obey God or man, you can decide, but we're going to obey God. And they kept preaching Jesus. And lastly, in, chapter, in uh, number 10, in 3 John, John writes to the church implying that they must get rid of their false pastor, Diotrephes. Why? Because he was a heretic who rejected apostolic doctrine and was removing from the church everybody who embraced apostolic doctrine. What's the point? These ten were different examples of disobedience of citizens to government, of wife to husband, children to parents, more citizens to different governments, even religious laws, preaching the gospel, and even among church leadership. How can we summarize all this? So the question, the way back in point number two, I said that the Bible tells us to submit and obey to authorities, even if we don't feel like it, even if we disagree, even if our conscience goes against it, we are to excel in submission, to be good submitters. We are not to be the tail who wags the dog. We're to submit to authority because it's ultimately Jesus' authority. So submission is to Jesus. And yet, the Bible gives us Many instances where it was right to disobey authority. So how can we turn this into principles? Four principles of when we know how to disobey. These are four principles. Number one, we disobey when authorities command what God forbids. We disobey when authority commands what God forbids. In other words, they're actively promoting evil. You must do this evil, which is evils defined by the Bible. So number one, when authorities command what God forbids. Number two, when authorities forbid what God commands. I flipped it. Commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands. One is the active promotion of evil. This next one, forbid what God commands, is the suppression of obedience. As if you, uh, you cannot assemble as a church and go to church, for example. If there's suppression of obedience. Number three, here's a third one to understand. We can disobey when authorities sinfully violate their God-given sphere sovereignty. How does an authority violate what God gave them? Two ways. They sinfully abuse their enforcement. So remember I said earlier that really the state holds the sword, parents hold the rod, they're the only ones able to enforce compliance all other authorities have different mechanisms, church discipline, getting fired, a husband going to the elders of the church, or something along those lines. But when an authority 
misuses their enforcement mechanism, if parents become unbiblical with their use of the rod and begin to hurt and harm in ungodly ways their children, when the, when the state turns the sword upon its citizens, when a husband begins to physically abuse his wife, when it's misused authority, you can disobey. Or, in this third point, when, a, when an authority sinfully usurps the authority and jurisdiction of another. So, from last week, if the state who holds the sword also tries to hold the keys of the kingdom and the parental rod, taking it to themselves, they have usurped the jurisdiction that Jesus assigns to them in the Bible and they are no longer in proper authority. So why can we disobey? Because if we were to obey a tyrant, we'd be disobeying Jesus. Because it's a misuse of that authority. Jesus does not authorize those authorities to command what God forbids, forbid what God commands, misuse their enforcement mechanisms, or usurp the jurisdiction of another. He disallows that. And fourth... We're going to move fast. And fourth, in this one, there's a thousand qualifications. I want to give you just the, the principle here. We can disobey when it deeply violates a biblically calibrated conscience. Even if the authority is operating in their purview and not in clear violation of Scripture, the draft. That's a pretty easy example of getting into conscience issues and biblical debate. This is not, though, here's the thing when you get into a biblically calibrated conscience. To say that not every moment is a Martin Luther, here I stand moment. Eat your broccoli. Here I stand, O oh Lord, and I could do no other. Maybe that should be a Martin Luther moment. Except in my household. Your conscience, it is neither safe nor right to go against your conscience. But our conscience cannot be weaponized as a cloak of anarchy. It cannot be used as a cloak of autonomy. The person, if you do, stand against it. I really think the speed limit should be 95, even though it's 45. Here I stand, and so I'm going to reap the consequences and get put away for going that fast. So you'll reap the fruit of your disobedience, and you may have no other recourse other than God to go to him. So remember, we're to obey and submit, even if we disagree, when an authority is operating within the parameters Jesus gave them, i.e. they're not sinning, even if they aren't Christian. But when authorities violate the ways of Jesus, they forfeit their authority, becoming tyrants, and we obey Jesus, not man. Now, when you look back of those ten examples I gave you, almost all of them are some type of group decision. Almost all of them. Not all of them, but almost all of them. I think that puts in some type of implied safeguard that if we as a church or if you as a household or you as an individual were to choose to civilly disobey, to uh, uh, not take the vaccine and the letters that I wrote on many of your behalfs to your employers to not take that, there's a group decision involved in there. And I think there's wisdom in not flying solo, but thinking about, is this right? Is it permissible for me to disobey? So, so when we disobey, we are, we are searching the Bible. We're having a biblically calibrated conscience. We're seeking the counsel of others. And then when we choose to disobey, we have to appeal to other authorities. So the wife who was unsubmissive to her husband, perpetually, the husband can go to the church elders or 
a, a trusted family and seek the prayerful intervention, if the children are being neglected and abused by the parents, they can go to the church elders. They should go to the church elders and let them know. They can go to the authorities and contact the police if need be. When we have to disobey, when we're being under tyranny, we can go to other authority structures to ask them intervene, ultimately appealing to God. And listen, what I'm not saying is you have to always disobey. I'm speaking generally here. There might be instances where you're free to disobey and you choose not to for the sake of the gospel. And there might be times that you disobey for the sake of the gospel. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Every situation is specific. It takes wisdom, prayer, and counsel. So don't hear me saying you must rebel and resist at the drop of a hat. We as believers are to be known by our submission and obedience. Why? The final brief point. What's the purpose of godly submission? Here's why. Because we're like Jesus. Just as there has never been a one who has more greatly and beautifully exercised authority than Jesus Christ, there has never been a human being who's walked the face of the earth more perfectly submissive than Jesus Christ himself. So when we submit even to unjust authorities, we are experiencing what Christ experienced, whose whole life was submission to his good parents, and the ungodly religious authorities over him in Israel, and the tyrannical authorities of the Roman government, and more. That's why we submit and obey. It displays Jesus. It's why verse 12 tells us, Keep your conduct among unbelievers honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. It's why wives are told, that when they submit to their husbands, even if some do not obey the word, verse 1, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see a respectful and pure conduct. It's why 3, 16 and 17, down in our text, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it's better to... Suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Our submission, even to those who cause suffering in our lives, pictures Jesus to all who have eyes to see, because he suffered in life and death for our sins, on our behalf, under tyranny. Our submission, even to those who cause suffering in our lives, preaches Jesus to ourselves, since nothing happens to us, that hasn't already happened to Jesus. Are you under unjust authority right now? You're in good company. Jesus knows. Jesus is with you. Our submission, even to those who cause suffering in our lives, models Jesus who endured a life of suffering and mocking and hostility and betrayal and beating and everything. Our submission blesses and encourages Christian authority over us as they see what Jesus is like through our submission to them. Our godly submission, then, is about the gospel because it pictures Jesus. So, church, let's look like Jesus. Amen? Lord, we thank you for the gift of authority and the gift of submission. Lord, write your word on our hearts by your spirit, we pray in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. Friends, let's stand.